Everybody, welcome back to the Sports Not interview. Today, we're joined by Eric at home. He is the lead NFL writer at NFL.com uh, when it comes to the draft. And of course, just back from the combine as the NFL free agency period is about to begin, the legal tampering period beginning of next week, and then, of course, free agency in the start of the new NFL year on March 14th. Eric, let's start with the combine. Just a, a couple things. Number one, of course, we'll get into some of the, the position stuff. But when you come back from the combine, it's, it's so interesting because there's so many storylines, so many players who do well, might not do well. But when you look at the combine in 2024 and getting back from Indianapolis, sort of what jumped out at you overall uh, covering the event uh, this season? Yeah, I think we we knew it was a, a a strong class at certain positions. You know, quarterbacks been pretty pretty hyped up, wide receiver certainly, and that that was backed up by I think a lot of the performances, even with some guys not working out, some of the top ones and um, offensive tackle and really interior offensive line too were were deeper than I imagined. I was maybe had a little more appreciation for the corners than I realized too, but it, I go back to the offensive line and just say. It's a really good group, and you know we, the the league needs it. There are going to be a lot of high picks of that position. Uh, you know there are interior guys that I maybe underrated a little bit, overlooked. You know some of the testing helped sort of bear that out. Uh, conversations I had, but you know some of these these monsters at offensive <laughs> tackle moving the way they did and jumping the way they did, really impressive stuff to back up. A lot of them are, are two and three and four year starters, so. Yeah, that's a position that the league needs, and, and this year's got a good supply. Yeah, it's interesting, too. And we'll get to the quarterbacks in a minute because everybody likes to talk about quarterbacks. But uh, I was the thing I was shocked by, because I was there uh, Tuesday through Thursday only, mm -hmm. was how deep the center class is like, you know, I know, I know fans out there don't necessarily like to talk about centers, but it's vital position. We see there's six or seven that were on the free agent market that are in the NFL now. And then of course we've seen a couple more get cut loose, including up in Buffalo over the last few days. Talk about that. I mean, it's it, the, the NFL executives have to be excited about that. Cause if you can get a good center uh, on a rookie contract uh, to build that offensive line, that's a big deal. But what did you see there? Yeah, I mean, you have some players, uh, you know, like, there's not a lot of experience there. Like Jackson mm. Powers Johnson started one year, can also play guard. You know, there's there's excitement about him at, at either spot. Um, you know, I wouldn't say it was the best weekend for, for Cedric Van uh, Pran, Granger. He added the Granger part to his name this year. Um, but but a, a three-year, you know, experienced guy who I think, you know, still has some upside there. Um you know, I would say probably the biggest, well, I don't know about the biggest winner, but Graham Barton got, had good grades for his interviews. I thought he did, you know, well from based on conversations I had started at center in his career, moved to left tackle, probably going to move back inside in the NFL. Um, you know, Hunter Norzad from Penn state. There are a few more who are pretty good at that position. Zach Frazier. We didn't get to see a full workout from him, but he's highly regarded too. So yeah, I mean, even, you know, a few, few more who could slip in there and, and uh, either guards or centers or guards or tackles, excuse me, who move into center as well. But uh, yeah, pretty good guard group too. Not a yeah. exceptional one, but a solid. Uh, and then the tackles back it up. So all three yeah. positions are well represented. Incredible. Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, we'll go back to the quarterback now. And I'd love to get your take on this because being there and obviously we knew these some of these guys weren't going to throw they weren't going to work out and starting with caleb williams um there seems to be a lot of i don't know if it's negativity or question marks about caleb williams um what did you think about his approach i thought you know when, when he was at the press conference when he was around he was very impressive but i understand too him saying you know i'm not going to do 32 medical exams because i'd be shocked and i'd love to hear your opinion if the bears don't take him. So he kind of knows where he's going at least, but what was your takeaway kind of, and, and your overall view of the Caleb Williams situation and maybe some of the uncertainty, at least those of us in the media and others have over uh, what he's going to be like once he gets in the NFL. Yeah. I mean, I, I knew, I knew it was bound to happen that his, his character and everything he said and did was going to be highly scrutinized after the, the 2022 season. It was an incredible year. He wins the Heisman trophy. He comes back, you know, with eligibility left and, you know, had kind of put himself in that Trevor Lawrence, Andrew Luck discussion as far as, you know, can't miss type prospect. 
Of course, didn't play nearly as well, I don't think, although, you know, extenuating circumstance with that offensive line, the defense, and, and everything that, that USC was up against. So, you know, there were some factors to, to help kind of explain it. But then, you know, everybody had, had an opinion on his attitude or his personality or his leadership quotient or whatever. And, look, it's so hard in even in brief combine meetings to determine that, much less – you know, spend a year with a guy like, for instance, Cliff Kingsbury, you know, last year was with him. You know, I think he has a pretty good feel for, for whether Caleb's a true leader or not and is, is communicating that to, to the commanders. We'll see if they're in the mix at all. But, um, yeah, the other teams are still doing that process now. They've, they've watched him in person. They've spent time around him. But really, you know, for a lot of teams deciding on quarterbacks, it's going to be that two-day visit or two- or three-day visit that they often take. And, you know, I felt like Caleb was taking agency over his draft plan, if you will, and, mm-hmm. you know, kind of slimming down the pool, knowing that, you know, if he if he falls, it's to number two, right? It's not that far. <laughs> so, uh, you know, he can be a little more choosy and a little more picky with it. And, and I don't really see a problem with it, right? I mean, you're, you're taking a risk. If, if teams truly are irritated by anything that he does or Marvin Harrison Jr. or Malik Neighbors or anybody else who – you know, opted out of certain portions of the combine. Well, they have to know that there's a risk that comes with it. And I have no problem if they're understanding. Now, look, I mean, Caleb and Marvin don't have agents. So, mm-hmm. it, you know, you, you wonder how much of that they're aware of. But I'm with you. I think he's a smart kid. And, and you know, there he's he's got a a personality that comes off as a little different to some people. But, you know, I, I don't see any reason at this point, like you said, to, to, to not think that the Bears aren't, you know, dead set on, on taking him or very much in the, you know, in the camp of, you know, Williams until proven otherwise. So right. that's kind of where I stand and that's where I would guess they stand. But um, there is still a process here. They have to decide, mm-hmm. can we hand the keys of the franchise over to him and, and trust him as a uh, as a pillar of the team? Yeah, no question. And the big three quarterbacks, of course, uh, Williams, and then you have Drake May and Jaden Daniels. We've seen a lot of, I think, energy coming out of the combine, at least for me, th- around Jaden Daniels. And the fact that perhaps Washington, who was thought to, okay, going to take Drake May at number two, yeah. but maybe Daniels jumps over him. And, and I sort of feel like through this whole process since the end of the college season – that even though everybody who scouts, everybody who pays attention to the NFL knows about Drake May and that he was going to be at the top of the draft, it seems like he's gotten lost in the shuffle. And now you see Daniels with this big push. What do you, what do you make of that, and, and why do you think that's happening? Yeah, and, and I would even say that it's, there's, this, there's a, a chance that J.J. McCarthy goes ahead of May. I don't think May mm. is tumbling or that you know teams have this, this big fear about him. I don't think they love the way his season ended, you know, the the Clemson game, the NC State game, you know, there was some uh, there was a downturn in his play. I think people may have, you know, been critical in saying uh, he didn't elevate that program and as much natural abilities he has, he still kind of uh, you know, leaves some plays out there uh for the other team to make on his passes and you know, that I don't know. I, I guess I've I've heard some of this stuff and, and rolled my eyes a little bit. I still think he's a terrific talent and, and has every chance to be a, a franchise quarterback. But, yeah, there are some things he needs to tighten up. As far as Daniels goes, I mean, I, it, it, there aren't too many players that you reasonably can comp to, to Lamar Jackson. I don't think he's a, you know, a, 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 you know, a dead ringer for him, but there's there's some overlap there. And he's got that electric running ability. He can throw it all day. I mean, even if his accuracy isn't precise, it's good enough for a quarterback who's going to put your, you know, your team in a lot of second and fours and, you know, favorable situations. It's another player you have to account for. And, and you know, in a way that a pocket passer doesn't demand that kind of attention. So there's a lot to like about his game. He's got a poise and a maturity about him. He's been through – you know, they kind of bottomed out at Arizona State. He reinvented himself at LSU. Uh, the thin frame is going to be something for, for some teams to get hung up on. But, yeah, I heard the same talk that Washington may favor him over May. And, you know, the, the only surprise may be that the offense that May ran is very similar to the one Cliff Kingsbury ran, you know, an air raid steeped system. Um, and it's possible that, that Kingsbury said, okay, you know, I like the tools, but I think this kid's more special and look what we did with Kyler in Arizona, blah, blah, blah. 
Um, and it's hard to know there because new head coach, new GM, new OC, new owner, there's a lot of new there. And <laughs> they want an exciting player, but also somebody who's game ready. And maybe Daniel's running ability and his experience give him kind of a floor um, that's just a, a tad higher than, than what May can give you from day one. Yeah, good stuff. I know at, at number three there, you have the Patriots sitting there. There's been a lot of conversation. And coming out of the combine, as you heard too, it was a lot of like, well, the Patriots are going to take a quarterback. Um, do you feel, you know, it's lying season, as you know, and so people talk a lot and because they want to increase the value of their pick because if they're going to trade out of it, boy, if you, can get, if you can get people convinced that you might take a quarterback there, then it becomes more valuable. What do you think with the Patriots there, whether it's May or Daniels, whoever's there, or McCarthy, if he jumps up there, what do you think they do uh, and you think they, I mean, with all the needs New England has, yeah. do they, do they, is this another situation like we saw in Carolina last year where, okay, go get your quarterback. I get it. It's the most p- important position on the field, but is that a good situation for a quarterback to go into? Yeah. I don't get the sense that, you know, like they're going to do the Carolina type thing and, and mortgage picks to move up. If anything, I think they're going to be more likely to move back and, you know, it's possible they stay at three and take a quarterback or depending on what they do in, in the you know, the free agency portion, whether it's by trade or signing, you know, they could say, hey, we got Marvin Harrison Jr. on the board. Maybe that's appealing to them. They haven't had a weapon of that caliber since probably Randy Moss, I'm guessing. Obviously, yeah. you know, the slot receivers aside and everything. But, um, yeah, I mean, you, you hear that they're interested in signing a Jacoby Brissett, somebody like that, and makes a lot of sense. He's been there before, respected guy, has plenty of starting experience. You know, you know what you're getting in him, and that would lead me to believe that they're going to draft somebody at that position. But is it at three? Maybe not. I don't know. I, I kind of got the impression that Elliot Wolf is very, you know, the de facto GM now, mm-hmm. very much interested in adding picks, and so possibly it's moving from three to let's say eight, where Atlanta's picking, or. Uh, Minnesota's spot, you know, Kevin O'Connell has a relationship with the Patriots. Maybe that plays in, maybe it doesn't. Um, you know, there are other teams like the Broncos certainly who are desperate to move up and, and get their guy. So there are going to be some good offers. I think I re- you know, I, you can get oh, two yeah. teams bidding against each other and then maybe you have, you know, Bo Nix fall to you at the end of round one or early round two or wherever JJ McCarthy could be there at eight. You know, I mean, there are options for him if they go that route. Michael Penix would probably still be on the board at some point there. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, they I think they don't feel married. Obviously, if something funky happens at one and two, that may change their plans. But I wouldn't be shocked if they sit back and, and field some offers for that pick. Yeah, I've always identified that third pick as really out of the top three. That was really the most likely to be in play as we go into the draft. Uh, Before we move off the quarterbacks real quick, um, Penix Jr. and then, of course, Bo Nix, because McCarthy, as you said, was kind of soaring as we were there. Uh, What did you see from those two guys? And obviously, Michael Penix Jr., his medicals checked out really, really well. That was a huge question mark going in and one of the things that people talk about with him. Uh, What did you see from those two guys? And and did one maybe uh, leapfrog the other? Yeah, I mean, it's they're, they're two different guys. Obviously, we've seen three great battles between them the last two seasons. And, uh, you know, Penix has just been a little bit better. And his team's been a little bit better uh, than Oregon in that span. But, you know, such closely uh, contested games. And yet two different style quarterbacks. I love that J- Jim Nagy put them both on the same senior bowl roster. Let him kind of battle it out. It created kind of a natural competition during those practices. I thought... Penix had clearly the best arm talent of any quarterback in Mobile. Um, he wasn't always accurate and precise. Again, you're, you're meeting mm-hmm. these receivers and you're learning a new system and all that. So I, I try not to put too much on that, but you could tell the difference one quarterback to the next and, you know, how consistently they're, they're placing the ball in the right spot. And, you know, Nick's got better as the week went on and was better in the red area. I would say overall, you know, seemed to get rid of the ball pretty quickly and, and efficiently. Um, so he's probably got the, the, the lowest ceiling of the top six, but a fairly high floor and he's got some athletic ability. He's got some leadership ability. He's, you know, pretty accurate 15 yards and in, and, you know, maybe you can, you can get something out of him as your, your year one starter in a place like new England or Las Vegas, or, you know, one of these other teams like that. Uh, Penix is more of a wild card because of the injury history. 
Um, and you know, 32 teams may look at his injury past as in 32 different ways, right? Shoulders are always tricky, multiple ACLs, you know, that, that puts you in a position where you're more likely to suffer one at some point. So even if he's looking good now, you can't ignore the history and, and, you know, it is a concern, but there is something about him. If you get him in the right system, a vertical passing game, let him take shots the way he did at Washington, you know, he's got that, that, that quick release. He doesn't have a lot of passes batted down for, for the sort of three quarters motion that he has. And, um, he's intriguing. He's got enough athleticism to, to move out of pressure's way. He didn't take a lot of sacks last year. I, I would love to see him play a 10 year career and see how it plays out. But again, the injury stuff you can't overlook. I, I, it's hard to know who's going to go first. I think Penix is, is more of the, the dice roll, but yeah. you know, teams will, will often take that route. And depending where he falls to or goes at, um, you know, a team could be getting a great bargain. And if you're going to take a risk on somebody, if it's in the second round or third round, depending, I, I don't think he'll fall to third, but who yeah. knows, then, then what the heck, you might as well roll with it. Um, before we move off the, the, the guys you saw at the Combine, too, you mentioned all the cornerbacks because it's such a great cornerback class. And I know he's talked about being at the top of the class, but man, I was impressed with a Terry on Arnold um, just being, you know, the way he handled himself there, his personality, and, and then talking to others who've interviewed him that were down at Alabama. Uh, talk about his, his, his ability, because I just, I was, uh, here's a guy I think he could go right into an NFL locker room and sure he's a rookie. He's got lots to learn. It's a, it's a hard position to jump into the NFL right away and perform at the top, top level. But were you impressed as I was with him? Yeah, he's he's got a magnetic personality and he's got a play style that that shows some some grit. You know, he's got a little vinegar in his veins and he plays with an edge to him. And, um, you know, I saw some recovery speed. He tested pretty well. You know, I checked off a lot of boxes. I still think there's some some rawness to his game. And if if I I mean, amongst the games that I watched, the ones where he struggled the most were against uh, Texas and against Michigan in the Rose Bowl, you know. So those are two bigger, you know, big-time competition uh, games right there. So, you know, is he is he going to step in and, and be Sauce Gardner as a rookie? Probably not. But I do think that he's the kind of guy who can learn from his mistakes and not dwell on them too much at the same time. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that's really what you're looking for, a guy with, uh, you know, the, enough sort of, long memory to, to, to know what not to do, but also a short memory to move on to the next play. And he's got that, I think. And, you know, it was, it was fun watching his playmaking grow this year too, especially in the second half of the season. You know, there, there was, there was some t- first round talk around October, but it didn't really crystallize. I don't think until he started making plays, more plays on the ball. So, right. you know, you back that up with a good combine and, and it's, Probably between he and, and Quinion Mitchell from Toledo as, as cornerback one. And, you know, yeah. Mitchell's got a lot of fans, so we'll, we'll have to see how that shakes out. <laughs> he does. Uh, I am one of them. He's, he really impressed me. Um, I, and we'll move off the draft just for a second before we let you go. And that is, look, we know before the draft comes, we have free agency coming up next week. And I think most NFL teams, they had their estimate for what the cap would be at. It was higher than most people expected. How do you anticipate – that increase in the cap, the free agency class that we have. There's a lot of cornerbacks, for example, in in free agency. Uh, other positions, not so much. Even running back, which I know has been a depressed value system there for running backs in the NFL and not a great draft, obviously, for running backs. So when you look at that, uh, how do you think that rise in the cap is going to affect a lot of these teams who were looking to bolster themselves in the draft, but also now might have some more flexibility with some free agents that are on the street. Yeah. I think, you know, talking to some of the executives at their, their combine sessions, there was, there was some surprise, right? I mean, this was Mm -hmm. in some cases, 12 to to $20 million more than they expected uh, for the cap to be. So that was obviously great news for them. And, you know, you still have to figure out, you know, who's actually going to be free. Now we know who's been tagged and, and given the, the franchise and transition tags and all that, but you know, you potentially could have Chris Jones and Christian Wilkins hit the market, you know, which is unusual for two sort of top five type uh, free agents like that at that position, especially uh, come free. You know, we don't know what's going to happen with Legereus Sneed and mm-hmm. you know, the Kirk Cousins situation is obviously fascinating. There aren't a ton of quarterbacks this year. 
Um, but, you know, a lot of the big names have already been snapped up. So, yeah, I'll be curious to see who's that that sort of middle class free agent that gets top tier money because it happens every year. And sometimes oh, it yeah. works out. Sometimes it does. Sometimes you get an Andre Dillard situation where teams project and they say, all right, I think in two years he's going to be worth whatever we're paying him. So, you know, that's the big one. And, and you know, player like uh, – Mike Unwainu from from New England, or, or you know Bryce Huff, or something like that from the Jets. I mean, you know, you, where you've had a good amount of work, a good body of work to study, but maybe there's still a bit of a projection involved there. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating. There's clearly going to be some spending in the teams who were, you know, thirty and forty million dollars under the cap, and there were a handful. You know, their work got a lot easier this off season, and it's it's obviously going to be a lot easier to clean up the books in that way. So, and, and lastly, I'd like to ask you, I mean, big free agent now on the market, I guess you would consider that, is, uh, is Russell Wilson. We all knew that was coming to an end in Denver. Aside from what the Broncos paid for Russell Wilson, as far as not only the money, but also the draft capital they gave up to Seattle, he hits the street. He's got, I think he's got stuff left in the tank, obviously. He did pretty well last yeah. year in the situation he was in. When you look at Russell Wilson, uh, where do you see, I mean, Listen, I, I, I counted off, off, off my list eight or nine teams who legitimately could use upgrade at quarterback. When you look at what Russell Wilson has to offer at this point in his career and the fact that he can sign somewhere for, you know, basically a pittance compared to what he would get on the open market uh, a few years ago, what do you, how do you see that working out and maybe some of the teams that where he would be a good fit? Yeah, it's nice when the, uh, your former team is still paying your salary, right? That's always, <laughs> always helps make the decision a little easier, right? Um, yeah, I'll be curious to see, you know, Kirk is obviously a fascinating situation to see end up back in Minnesota or Atlanta. I could see whoever doesn't get cousins of those two would certainly be interested. Um, the one that's sort of fascinated me that I've heard connected to him and, and, you know, at first I didn't really, wasn't sure, but Pittsburgh, you know, that's a team that's been yeah. mentioned quite a bit. Um, I'll be curious to see how they truly view Kenny Pickett, you know, and whether, uh, Mason Rudolph's back in the mix that too I mean Tennessee maybe is a as a, a I mean they've said they like uh, Will Levis so I assume that's not a realistic landing spot but the Raiders especially with Garoppolo expected to be uh, released he could stay in the division and, and try to torment Sean Payton Revenge. if he wants to but <laughs> yeah I mean New England would that be a possibility maybe you know I don't know so it depends on you know, I think people can – obviously, he can start now. You know, that's the beauty of, of getting released is right. you have your, your, your kind of head start on free agency. So I'll be curious to see if, if he gets something done quickly or if the other teams kind of want to wait to see how some pieces fall elsewhere. Yeah, it's always fascinating to me, too, because people, I, I think for, for a lot of fans who are watching us, they go from end of the season, okay, they pay attention to the combine, but then they're focused on the draft. But really what teams do in free agency during this period can really influence. So, yeah, if you're a team like Atlanta and you go get a Russell Wilson and you're not willing to trade up to get – one of those top three or four quarterbacks that you may like, yep. then suddenly it's a big deal. So uh, I'm always fascinated. I love this time of the year yeah. in between in between the combine and the draft because there's so much that goes down. And we certainly appreciate you spending some time to talk with us. And, of course, you can read Eric's stuff up on NFL.com. Eric, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Pleasure's mine. Have me on any time. I appreciate it. 